Dear beloved of God and of mine, thanks for watching. I welcome you to this video and we will continue today with the next uh, with the next episode in this series about the mindset of people, uh, whether it is a mindset that is seeking for truth and truth only, or a mindset that is preserving uh, one's own views, one's own traditional views. That's what it's all about. And now we are in the second part, of course, that we are looking at this mindset in terms of application with regard to scripture so um, I hope you will enjoy this video as well we will switch to the slides this was the last one and we already went through it these are let's say examples of the fact that the key is always relatively close and in this case the example was the sheep and the goat uh, nations and the judgment with regard to those nations. So we went through that, so it, we know it's not an individual judgment, not at all, it has to do with nations and the location of those nations on the earth, the literal earth in the literal fourth eon, or you could say the millennial kingdom. That is what it's all about. So let's continue with another example. Figures of speech in general, but of course I'm going to use one specific one. Again, as an example of the fact that the key is always relatively close. God puts it closely, so you don't have any argument or escape when you stand before the great white throne as an example. You will not be able to defend yourself. You will, you will have to look at yourself like your mindset really was back then on earth. So the question is, why does God deliberately use figures of speech in his word? Because God has designed his word, right? And he deliberately put more than 200 different types of figures of speech. Did you know that? It's really, it's really unbelievable, but that's the truth. So the question is, and within those figures of speech, why did Jesus, this is a typical one, did Jesus say at the last meal as he broke the bread, he said, this is my body. So he, he broke the bread and he showed that bread, of course, and he says, this is my body. Was it his little body? Of course not. It was bread. That was literal the case, literally the case. But he said, this is my body. Why? Because it is a figure of speech called a metaphor. A metaphor. So let's continue. It's all deliberately. So we can ask ourselves what far-reaching consequences this has had using this particular figure of, spe a figure of speech within the Catholic Church predominantly. Wow. I think that is that is huge. This, uh, I would say, misinterpretation of God's word. Sometimes it's so sad that it is humorous, of course, because Jesus could have said, this is like my body. And then it would be more literal in that sense. And that it will be that would be a simile. That's a f also a figure of speech, but close to the literal uh, meaning, and that's a simile. But he didn't. He used a metaphor. What's the consequence of that? Let's take a look. People, look at this one. People who love rituals have turned this into one of the most absurd rituals ever called transubstantiation great expression huh well just to be able to pronounce it you need a theological and doctoral degree transubstantiation means that the well-known hostie mean you know the catholic hostie during the communi communion celebration of the catholic church is seen by them as being miraculously transformed 
into what? Into the literal body of Christ that is contained as matter in that hostie. Well, this is truly unbelievable. Unbelievable. But what is the case here? What is the trick? This is the trick. People who love rituals will distinguish themselves negatively and they will come floating to the surface and it will be immediately apparent with those people, those kind of people, and there are billions of them, it will become apparent that they love the rituals, not the truth, but the rituals. You see the, you see the difference. Okay, so let's continue. And now another one, another example of the fact that the key is always closed relatively. Parables. Also, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. If you want to, you can immediately use this story to prove that it is about endless torment because it is not a parable, is it? That's what I've always heard in, when I was in church. No, this one is not a parable because when it's a parable, it always says it is a parable. That I remember. That's what they told me when I grew up. But if you really critically search for the truth, you take God's word seriously and then you start from certain often well-known truths. Then you will also discover that in the original manuscript and languages, i.e. Hebrew and Greek, the real word of God, in the, uh, uh, there is, so in those original languages, there is no punctuation or capitalization, nor division into chapters and verses, even no division between words. All the words are written immediately as if it is one long word. Oh yes, and that's of course to also avoid people writing words between words. These have been added, all these things like punctuation, etc., have been added to the translations by people based on their own insights and traditions. In this case, the most relevant one or addition is a division into chapters and verses. And this division, in this case in Luke 15 and 16, um, I would say it has been done, I cannot say deliberately, but the effect of it is a deliberate one. And of course, that is all directed relatively by Satan. Okay, let's continue. So you will discover that at the beginning of Luke 15, it does say that it is a parable. And you will find, listen to this, you will find that it has, this parable has five parts. Five parts. It's the same parable, the same kind of principle that Jesus is laying out here. It's Jesus is laying forth, bringing forth. But he uh, he parts it, he divides it, uh, he def divides it into five separate stories, but it's about the same parable, the same principle. So you see that it is a parable, and you will find that it has five parts of which this story, the story of, the, of Lazarus and the rich man, is the fifth part. And the story of the prodigal son, as an example, is the third part of this same parable. And guess what? When, uh, before the story of the prodigal son starts, it also doesn't mention that it's a parable. Only at the beginning, before the first story in that sense. So you see, if you want to know truth, you will find it. 
because you will think and you will your mindset will be consistent you will look for consistency in the word of god and this is consistent only at the beginning five parts same principle next if you see that it is indeed a similarity then you study it from that jewish mindset that means thinking attitude with completely different results and conclusions voila then you'll discover that it is in fact sorry that in fact it is a parable that solely refers to the jews especially pertaining to their leadership the pharisees and the sadducees you'll see also that the imagery as uh, specifically points toward terminology from the talmud not the torah rather than the torah it's the time talmud language you read in this story and also that this story is crammed with figures of speech that were understood very well by those jewish leaders and they obviously didn't like it was a very well known set of figures of speech in their language and also in their tradition and culture from the talmud and the talmud is not god's word at all okay so the question is what do we want do we want to read what is truly written or do we want to read what we want to read a well-known passage that i quote to show that god will ultimately save everyone is recorded in 1 timothy 4:10 where it says for this is while we toil and struggle because we have trusted in the living god who is the savior of all men especially of believers again god who is the savior of what whom all men and then after that especially of believers how clear can god's word be how clear and yet yet christians manage to focus on the especially of believers part as if the earlier part savior of all men doesn't matter anymore and this we're talking about god's word from which it is quote is, is quoted this uh, passage therefore also god's words and then the question is would god contradict himself to on the one hand to say that he's the savior of all men and then all of a sudden not all men anymore but only believers would he contradict himself of course not so the question is what does especially mean of course you're going to study that you want to know the truth right that's how you study the truth in fact does the phrase especially of believers contradict the earlier section savior of all men of course not wow how sad if one would think the answer would be yes wow and there are christians who would say yes because it suits their traditional views we find the same expression especially in galatians 6 verse 10 which says this therefore as we have occasion we are working for the good of all yet especially for the family of faith does do we then suddenly no longer work for the good of all yes or no because it says especially for the family of faith no longer for the good of all or 
and and only for the relatives of faith. The Greek word, and because you're going to the Greek now, always, not to the original languages. And then the Greek word, you will find that the Greek word for special or especially is malista. And that doesn't mean exclusively, but it means inclusively, in, but in a special way. What way? Let's see if I wrote it. Yes. The meaning of the expression, especially of believers, is simple. Believers have, current believers, I mean, current believers, have an earlier calling, that's it, than those who are now currently still unbelievers and or die in unbelief. But if you die in unbelief, it's not the end. Be assured of that. You will be resurrected and you will stand before the great white throne and you will be judged and not you can be condemned yes but it doesn't have to be the case it's uh, totally um, uh, dependent on how you lift your life on earth and that is also relatively because God has directed your life all along since before your birth that's that's the truth so the question is what is the difference between believers now currently and unbelievers currently it's simple unbelievers will receive belief later whether it is before they die here on earth or it is at the resurrection in the resurrection they will believe now the people who are believers currently are just given belief earlier that's all that's all so please take that into account believers have an earlier calling than currently unbelievers so how difficult is that to understand quite simple right but also what is your attitude your mindset towards this information that you will hear and understand now hey so this is really true god will save all mankind yes it is really true and that is why god is love god is love that he is he, his love is the cause of the fact that he will save all mankind and he's also almighty and he does all that he desires remember isaiah 46 10 that's what he does but with other in other words he will save all people ultimately in the end he will do it because he wants to do it and he can do what he wants okay so do you become happy what's your attitude right towards this information do you become happy because everyone will ultimately be saved and god actually turns out to be truly love and never lets the works of his hands go to waste or do you get angry like jonah because you secretly hoped that god would endlessly torment that terrible neighbor or merciless criminal criminal etc what's it gonna be so i would invite you to ponder on that and i'm going to end this video and in the next one we will continue and probably that will be the last one let's let's take a look all right well thank you very much for watching i hope whoever have uh, whoever has watched ponders these things and uh, hopefully for the christians among you as an example hopefully you come to the realization and ask god to give you that faith the realization that he is truly the savior of all mankind and that will make you glad thanks for watching again and see you next time